kind of a cripple because he helped Lord Grantham out in the war. And the latter reason, not the former, is why he gets hired as a valet, which is a guy that dresses other guys. A valet. I apologize. It's a hard C like that. It's really stiff. Which is a guy that dresses other guys, and everyone is all like, Yo, how can that cripple do stuff? And at one point he screws these metal things into his leg to walk better, and it hurts a lot, and is painful, and he suffers in silence because that is totally his thing. <laughs> then he falls in love with this housemaid named Anna, who is the coolest and also my spirit animal, according to Facebook. <laughs> But he doesn't tell anyone he is, that's a true story, but it was actually dates, so it was like really, it was adorable, until it wasn't. <laughs> Problems! Ah, uh, yeah, so, but he doesn't tell anyone he is actually already married secretly to basically the worst person on the planet ever, who causes lots of trouble for everyone, which is made worse by Kevin Carter's need to suffer a little bit in silence, because he is a good dude who just doesn't believe in himself. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause for Kevin Carter. <laughs> That was all true, and I'm going to read some fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just all right, so, uh, yeah, I think you guys would probably guess that. So, uh, I'm going to read a uh, book report about a book by Lester Bangs called Psychotic Reactions and Carburetor Dog. It's a very descriptive title, and it is exactly what's in the book. <laughs> R.E.M. name checked him in It's the End of the World as We Know It. Bob Seymour Hoffman played him in Almost Famous. But surface-level portrayals never really got to what was so fucking awesome about Lester Banks. What made him so awesome is that he wrote the most unfettered, torrented consciousness punk rock voice of any music critic ever. In 1988, Brown Marcus collected a bunch of his best essays and unpublished work and put them out as Psychotic Reactions and Carburetor Dog. The tagline is, Rock and roll is literature, and literature is rock and roll. <laughs> Which are the two things that Lester probably cared about the most. Jim Derodicus called him Hunter S. Thompson, Charles Bukowski, and Jack Kerouac, all rolled into one. Which I, I think was probably a compliment. <laughs> I, mean, I love all those people, but I know some of you don't. <laughs> uh, Lester himself wrote that he was preparing for a literary life quite different from that of the days when a young writer first practiced writing short stories, and the style of Hemingway, and Faulkner, and Fitzgerald, etc., etc., etc. In the meantime, reading the classics for background, but that he was just beginning to realize that he was coming up in the dawning days of a new era when literature would turn to toilet paper, daily news would become surrealistic. I, I kind of feel like I'm getting guilty of the, the same sort of surface level portrayal of him that everyone else was doing, but. Let me just say off the bat that he was a Romilar cough syrup swinging proto punk phenomenon with the same simultaneous neglect of and care for English that James Joyce had. He painted words in monstrous, scrunking swipes with such force that they tore into the canvas itself and left their mark there. Wester was the only person in history who could look Lou Reed from the Velvet Underground in the eye and call him an asshole. Because <laughs> he was an asshole too. <laughs> He was the editor of Cream Magazine, and the music industry would have somehow been even worse off if he wasn't around to keep him in check. Lester grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, and went about as far away from the watchtower as he could possibly go. He said he was influenced by everyone from Louis Ferdinand Céline to Antoine Artaud, and it shows in his writing. Throughout the course of Psychotic Reactions and Carburetor Dawn, which is one of the most accurate titles ever given to a book, <laughs> it really is, it's exactly what is in <laughs> Lester manages to do the following. He performs a Bayot beaten beatnik monologue, explaining the insanity of the time to his hypothetical grandkids, and still somehow manages to sound blase. <clears throat> Describes the sublime and the anarchic swallower of Iggy Pop and the Stooges. Eradicates James Taylor from relevance, ever. <laughs> Prophesies a terrifying post apocalyptic zombie filled wasteland before it was cool. <laughs> Rediscovers himself as a stumbling drunk of a saxophone player after he finally grocks John Poultry. Rhapsodizes over Van Morrison's austere album Astral Weeks. Brings his typewriter on stage with Jay Giles' band. 
and sits there typing, doing a live review of their show, as he's playing the best goddamn guitar solo in the entire world. Rips the ironically racist hipsters of the time, a new asshole, by pointing out their hypocrisy. Interviews the members of Kraftwerk and makes them look like shrugets from the SNL scene, while simultaneously heralding in the new era of electronic music. It's really incredible. It's only Jack Kaufman. Matter of factly drinks two bottles of cough syrup and goes to see Tangerine Dream. Sounds <laughs> like the most bumpy and impossible It eviscerates David Bowie for his racist, thin white Duke period. This is fucking horrible. Where he was so coked up that he was riding through London in a convertible, see Kylie every time. It is, it is, no, seriously, look this shit up. It's, it's like Bowie, Bowie has, has finally redeemed himself for this and renounced all racism, but he did so much cocaine that he didn't even remember that he recorded an album. <laughs> no, wait, literally, people ask him about it after, this is not a thing here. <laughs> literally asked him about it afterwards, and he was like, I don't recall. <laughs> Simultaneously glorifies and castigates the Clash for all the things that they should be glorified and castigated about. Gets to the bottom of what the Blaine Generation by Richard Hell and the Voidoids is all about, while exposing Richard Hell as the badass Lutcher Mon style poet that he was. Calls Lou Reed a pathetic death dwarf. <laughs> Calls Lou Reed a pathetic death dwarf <laughs> and a panderer living off of the dumbbell nihilism of a 70s generation that doesn't have the energy to commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Reed says the most ridiculous stuff while Lester pans his new album as, quote, pasteurized decadence. <laughs> Later in the book, Lester also says that he would suck the Reed's cock. Because he would also kiss the feet of those that drafted the Magna Carta. <laughs> That's true, it's a direct quote. <laughs> so, without a doubt, Lester's best moments came when they were either stolen Lou Reed or completely ripping them apart. Reed came out with this album called Metal Machine Music. Has anybody ever heard Metal Machine Music? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Metal Machine Music is nothing but guitar feedback. And nothing, that's it, nothing else. Lester called it, quote, a one hour, two record set of nothing. Nothing, absolutely nothing but screaming feedback noise recorded at various frequencies, played back against various other noise layers, split down the middle into two totally separate channels of utterly inhuman shrieks and hisses, and sold to an audience that was, to put it as mildly as possible, unprepared for it. <laughs> because sentient human beings simply find it impossible not to vacate any land where it's playing. <laughs> Lester tried to defend it when he interviewed by assuming that it was a big fuck you to the record company, that Reed was just trying to get out of his contractual obligations. But Lou wouldn't let himself get off so easy. He claimed that it was one of the best things that he'd ever written. And he said that it was only garage music to a, quote, untrained ear. <laughs> he also claimed that there were all kinds of symphonic ripoffs encoded in it, like Beethoven's Third or Vivaldi. <laughs> if you've heard this album, it is just like... <laughs> I mean, it's the worst thing. Uh, so Lester calls him out on absolute bullshit. Reed also claimed that he actually put illegal frequencies banned by the FCC. So he's sitting there recording screen, he's like, I'm gonna put the illegal ones on here. The sounds of the kids you can't hear because they're not allowed. And Reed actually said that he played this at concerts and it caused fights in the crowd. <laughs> Lester went on to expose his total racism and general hatefulness in the rest of the interview. But then, in the next issue of Cream, Lester wrote all about why Metal Machine Music was actually a good album. The first reason was, if you ever thought feedback was the best thing that ever happened to the guitar, well, Lou just got rid of the guitars. <laughs> on the flip side of this, Lester had an unquenchable lust for beauty. He even coined his own rubric for experiencing it, called the Trash Aesthetic. The Trash Aesthetic was his way of understanding the immutable beauty in everything we see around us without being <coughs> sanctimonious about it, the holiness and the filth of the world. His own albums reflected that in their chaos. Maybe the best description of the aesthetic was delivered in this essay about Van Morrison's 1969 album, Astral Weeks. He called it, A record about people stunned by life, completely overwhelmed, Solved in their skins, their ages and selves, paralyzed by the enormity of what in one moment of vision they can comprehend. It is a precious and a terrible gift. 
born of a terrible truth. Because what they see is both infinitely beautiful and terminally horrifying. The unlimited human ability to create or destroy, according to women. It's no Eastern mystic or psychedelic vision of the emerald beyond, nor is it some Baudelarian perception of the beauty of sleaze and grotesquerie. Maybe what it boiled down to is one moment's knowledge of the miracle of life, with its inevitable concomitants of vertiginous glimpse of the capacity to be hurt and the capacity to inflect that hurt, transfixed between pure rapture and anguish, wondering if they may not be the same thing or at least possessed to an intimate relationship. Lesser had problems. <laughs> he was actually addicted to drugs, maybe more than anyone else who ever lived. <laughs> he was a misogynist and transphobic, dabbled with racist undertones in some of his writing. And there are parts of his work that ring hollow. Like many rockers, he wasn't exactly a stand-up guy. You get the feeling that he knew he was capable of more, but he was on some kind of Hunter S. Thompson style roller coaster that only went down the hills and never back up. Everybody had problems, and everybody has problems, and Lester's were worse than a lot of other people's. I don't know, maybe it's just like Lester said within his final confrontation with Lou Reed. I never met a hero I didn't like, but then I never met a hero then maybe I wasn't looking for one. Mm -hmm. Thank you.